section an incomplete survey. There we are. Well, those who've seen me do things before, and this was over a year ago, will know that more often than not, when I do a presentation, some maths appears in it and everyone get, freaks out. So I decided to do something that's a bit easier on the brain um, tonight and um, talk a little bit about some space art and illustration. Now, of course, it is an incomplete survey because there's so much of it out there. Mm -hmm. and I at the end why didn't he cover insert name here unfortunately this is one of the problems with this but we'll, we'll do do a bit anyway um well let's start with this now um, before i come to this very thing of course um the earliest uh depictions of objects in space who were lunar calendars um carved into bone in the um, stone age uh dating back about thirty thousand years but this um, shield-like object, about a foot across in old units, um, is alleged to have dated from the Bronze Age, but we don't really know where it actually came from. It, it appeared in Germany, having been uh, looted from somewhere, and uh, eventually the police picked it up. Um, if, it, if it is Bronze Age, um, that makes it pretty old, but it might be later than that. It might be Iron Age. And what you see uh, on this disc are uh, what look like representations of the sun and the moon and stars. Or at least that's what you think it means. I don't think there's any doubt about the cr crescent-shaped uh, moon no. symbol on the right. But the other things could be anything, couldn't they, really? Well, I mean, you've, you've got that cluster of seven there, yeah. which yeah. could be the Pleiades. Yeah. It might be, yeah. But, and in fact, actually, that's an interesting point because I'm going to show you some other things where you see little clusters of stars. Um, diagrams. Um, the Greeks were very good at measuring things. And in fact, actually, of course, they knew that the Earth was um, a sphere, not flat. Um, and uh, in fact, of course, one of the ways in which they measured the distance of the moon was to look at the Earth's um, uh, curved shadow falling onto the moon and uh, did some geometry. Uh, the picture at the top there shows you that. And I, I won't go into details here because I do have um, a little bit of a talk about how that was done, um, which I'm going to save up. But um, that picture actually came from the Vatican Library. Um, and it's actually a 10th century transcription of the original Greek version. Uh, but underneath is a rather simpler uh, diagram that shows you how um, in fact, uh, they measured the distance to the sun. They figured that if you um, could uh, measure the angle subtended between the moon when it's at its first quarter and the sun, you have a right angle triangle and you can measure that very slender angle um, of the triangle. You could then determine the distance to the sun. And uh, it almost worked, except the angle so tiny, it was obviously possible to measure it with the technology at the time. But nonetheless, they got um, using, Aristarchus got using this method a sort of distance to the, to the sun in millions of miles, which um, is pretty impressive. Um, these are Chinese star charts from the 7th century. And uh, yes, you can see star clusters represented in these diagrams, although they're rather diagrammatic. These sort of strange uh, circles and uh, squares and zigzaggy formations may not be real things but you can't fail to notice uh top right there that they've got part of the constellation of orion quite clearly marked and above it i suspect that the object above it near the top of the diagram is in fact auriga the charioteer so um these are early representations of, of stars early star charts if you like although they're only partially accurate, as you can see, and partially fanciful. Um, of course, also you see um, uh, a lot of these things um, dating back centuries, um, diagrams representing uh, what they believe the solar system to be like. Um, obviously, these are all geocentric models with the Earth at the centre um, and the planets and the sun represented in uh, traveling around the earth. Um, but basically, um, of course, we now know, of course, that the earth is not at the center of the solar system, but nonetheless, to them, it did seem that that was an explanation for what they were observing. Um, comets appear 
in um, ancient uh, pictures and um, and, and in, indeed this uh, embroidery or tapestry as it's often referred to. On the left there you've got the Bay of Tapestry with uh, Halley's Comet which came round in early 1066. Of course comets in Europe were regarded as a portent of doom or evil uh, which was certainly the case for Harold II but not so much for William of Normandy so it doesn't quite work in that respect. And then on the right here we've got Giotto's Adoration of the Magi um, which was painted at the beginning of the 14th century. And again, you see a comet in the background, which is believed again to be Halley's Comet. Now, sometimes you see pictures which are said to be medieval, but are not. Uh, this is one uh, example. This is actually from a 19th century uh, book. Um, and the uh, picture is called La atmosphere. Uh, we don't know the artist who, who produced this illustration, but the author of the book, Camille Flammarion, um, uh, actually wrote um, a book on uh, the atmosphere, um, as you can see there, um, popular meteorology. It's not medieval, but um, it may, um, and indeed the book uh, may, have had an influence on Van Gogh, as we'll see in due course, um, but certainly the picture. Uh, looks like it might have done. Now, uh, we saw Chinese star charts earlier, but the first really accurate ones appeared at the turn of the 16th and 17th century. This is, uh, um, this is uh, Johann Bayer's um, uh, Uranometria. Um, a geometria is measuring the Earth. Uh, Uranometria is measuring the skies, um, which is what you see here. And uh, one of the illustrations uh, from that work is shown on the right there, that's Orion. And uh, they really are absolutely beautiful, aren't they? Um, they're produced with copper plate engraved engravings and printed onto, onto paper. And um, you can see two more here. That's Aquila on the left there, the eagle. Um, seems to have snatched a small child. Um, and uh, that's Cetus on the right there. So um, there were, in fact, uh, in this uh, work, something like about, um, I think, 51 star charts in all. 48 um, uh, show the standard constellations that we're familiar with. And there are um, extra pages which showed new ones that had been recently discovered by uh, Europeans voyaging into the Southern Hemisphere. Well, it's not just that we illustrate things in space, but obviously illustrate people looking at it. And uh, on the left there, you've got an um, a 18th century engraving um, um, showing a German astronomer using a transit telescope. Um, basically, it, if you look, it rotates in one axis only and you wait for objects to pass in front of it rather than steer your telescope sideways towards them. And it's used for measuring the positions of um, stars in the sky in terms of when they uh, pass through the field of the telescope and the angle they make with the horizontal. Um, and that's basically what that's for. It does look, by the way, as if he hasn't finished the telescope. There's an awful lot of spare parts lying on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there we are. And on the right here, you have Joshua Reynolds and family. And this is a classic illustration of the Enlightened period showing uh, the family here with globes, books, and a telescope showing that, and indeed a, um, an, a, a picture, a, a map rather, at the back there showing how people were beginning to gather knowledge in a more systematic way than they had previously. By the way, that telescope that's um, sat on the table there is a, um, a sort of Cassegrainian style design with an open aperture at the front. The light travels down the tube, hits the concave mirror at the bottom, goes back to the top, hits a convex mirror um, held at the front and then back down the tube again to the eyepiece at the back. Wow. Um, and here's some more illustrations from works of the period. You can see here uh, on, the, on the left there, um, pictures showing um, how the seasons occur, how uh, eclipses occur. Um, on the left there you've got a solar eclipse and on the right there's a picture of uh, how a lunar eclipse occurs. And then on the right hand side here, you can see a, a, a book that's literally just um, 
uh, covered in illustrations of equipment and um, you know astronomical objects of one sort or another, uh, including an illustration of the moon. You can see halfway down the left-hand page there. And you can make out a crater at the top of the moon, which is Tycho. Uh, Tycho the crater. And uh, what you're seeing there is um, obviously it's at the top of the picture because, of course, with a conventional telescope at the period, the images would be upside down. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of astronomical books were printed with pictures of the moon and the planets upside down until relatively recently. Um, well, this is an interesting fellow. Um, he's from the early uh, 19th century, Caspar um, David Friedrich, and um, he was a German Romantic landscape painter, generally considered uh, the most important German artist of his generation, in fact. Uh, he's best known for his allegorical landscapes, which typically feature contemplative figures silhouetted against night skies. Um, well, you can see... Uh, that sort of thing here in these pictures here on the right you have a, a figure sat next to what looks like a dolmen a you know a, um, a, uh, a stone age uh, grave um, and um, on the left there are a couple of figures looking um, from a, a forested view towards the sky and um, of course like most artists um, uh, Friedrich uh, often produced some multiple versions of his work and in fact actually um, if we look at the um, next slide, you can see, um, oh, sorry, I've jumped past. Uh, I was going to say, um, he actually produced several versions of the left-hand picture there. Um, this one shows a man and a woman, but there's also versions with two men. Uh, but what's interesting about these is, uh, from the astronomer's point of view, is what's in the sky. And uh, if we look at that more closely, you can see what it is. It's... Uh, 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 an early moon, if you like, um, a crescent moon, and uh, you can see a very bright dot next to it, which is almost certainly Venus. Mm. And um, also, you can see with the moon, you can see the effect of Earth shine, light reflecting off the Earth onto the back of the moon, onto the dark side of it, which reveals the entire disk of the moon. Um, now, these are really quite striking images, I think, and um, quite interesting. And the thing is that we do see that sort of thing. On the left-hand side of this slide here, you can see a genuine example of the Moon and Venus, which I took early one morning. Admittedly, this is um, a Moon that's very uh, almost at the end of its cycle, rather than the beginning, but you get the idea. Um, and what about flags? Well, if you look at these two flags on the right, they do have a striking resemblance to uh, Friedrich's paintings and indeed my, my photograph. Um, well, the stars are five-pointed because they, um, they represent the five pillars of Islam. But, and indeed, uh, the origin of this uh, star and uh, crescent design dates back to the Ottoman Empire, in fact. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's almost inescapable that this is an illustration um, of uh, the Moon and Venus um, as they would look in the night sky, up to a point anyway. Mm. Of course, the moon often features on mosques, uh, on the uh, minarets, you often see on the top um, uh, an illustration of the moon. And uh, although I haven't got a definitive sample to show you here, um, you often find that the angle of the moon as represented does um, indicate something about the latitude in which uh, the mosque was built. At temperate latitudes, the moon generally looks like it does on the left. And if you're on the equator, it often looks something like uh, the picture on the right there setting vertically downwards. Wow. Anyway, um, astronomers um, and uh, other people are often represented in cartoons. Um, you can see here on the left, Mr. Babinet has been told there's a comet and he's looking in the wrong direction. And there <laughs> lies one of the problems with astronomy. If a telescope's not pointing in the right direction, you might miss something, which is why we have these synoptic survey telescopes now with short focal lengths and wiring up angle views so that they don't miss anything. Um, uh, but uh, obviously the traditional telescope with this narrow field of view, in a sense like looking through a rolled up newspaper, um, unfortunately means you might miss something. Um, and on the right here we have a political 
cartoon, in fact. And uh, what you see in the picture there is a comet, um, and the comet is Napoleon. And Napoleon is flying towards the sun, which is represented by George III. And, um, and you can see John Bull is looking at the two um, with his telescope. And, um, and it says, I, I, Master Comet, you may uh, attempt your uh, periheliums or your devilish uh, heliums for all I care. But take the word of an old man, you'll never uh, reach the sun, depend upon it. Anyway, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> And of course, we still have cartoons about astronomers, um, as you can see on the left there, um, getting uh, an all round field of view. Um, I please don't do this. Um, and then on the right there, well, it's kind of rude, but it's quite funny as well. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Larson. We all know that Larson does lots of uh, science fiction, science, uh, you know, fact-based cartoons, um, like the one on the left with the aliens there. And of course, the uh, the rocket scientists, uh, everyone knows this one, uh, this crooked rocket. We're not exactly rocket scientists. Well, <laughs> believe it or not, some amateur rocket makers built one. <laughs> <laughs> which you see on the right there, and they launched it. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's fair to point out, if you look carefully at it, you'll notice that the tail fins are actually far more, uh, you know, sort of sensibly placed than on the original Larson cartoon. <laughs> there we are, folks. <laughs> now, of course, Jules Verne, as we all know, wrote um, uh, From the Earth to the Moon, a wonderful science fiction novel, and uh, it was copiously illustrated. And... Um, and you can see a couple of pictures from it. Um, on the left there, you can see the capsule um, halfway to the moon. And uh, if you're wondering what that object is on the right of the capsule, it is in fact a dog. Uh, they've always let the dog out for a wee. And it clearly, uh, in Jules Verne's universe, dogs can uh, survive in a vacuum. So it didn't seem to suffer any other effects. <laughs> and similarly, when they're on the moon, as you can see, no one's wearing a spacesuit, but and uh, and I must have wondered how they got back since their capsule is completely buried in the rocks, as you can see in the on the picture on the right there. But anyway, there we have it. And what's kind of interesting it is pure coincidence is that the capsule depicted in the Jules Verne story has almost the same dimensions as the Apollo um, command and service module that was sent to the moon uh, in the missions in the 60s and 70s. Well, we all know about Van Gogh and, of course, um, his Starry Night illustration, um, we can see on the left there, it's one of his most famous pictures. But probably um, it, it doesn't depict anything that's actually, um, it's not a direct copy of what he saw, it's more fanciful than that. Um, and it's hard to make out what the object on the right is meant to be. It could be the moon, it could be the sun. It could be just Venus. Uh, we don't really know. Um, but uh, on the right there is another of his paintings, which is far more approachable from an astronomer's point of view. Um, this is a view um, uh, over the Rhone River and looking due north. And if you look, you can see upper middle of the picture quite clearly the asterism of the plough or Big Dipper. There it is. You can't miss it. Um, and indeed, the star that's on its own over on the left-hand side is probably Arcturus. Um, so um, he did paint pictures were not just... Um, ah, I've just been informed that it is the crescent moon in the starry night picture. Uh, anyway, there we have it. But um, the... Uh, yeah, um, you can see the plough um, on, on the right uh, pic picture there. Moving on. Uh, into the 20th century. Of course, science fiction took off in a big way in the 1920s and 30s. And of course, in the 50s and 60s, those of us are old enough to remember, there was the Eagle comic, which was a uh, young boy's reading. And of course, depicted the wonderful Dan Dare, who was a space pilot. 
and uh, and of course his nemesis, uh, the evil Mekon on the left there, uh, who some people feel bears more than a slight resemblance to Dominic Cummings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's a starship on the left, isn't it? On the right there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, sadly, though, the illustrator, whose name um, I'm afraid has slipped my mind, um, he uh, left the, uh, the Eagle uh, comic uh, as an illustrator uh, towards the end of his career. And uh, essentially, um, like most people, I know, Friedrich, no exception, um, died more or less penniless. Oh, dear. Ah, well, classic. We have to move on to science fiction movies. Ah, These aren't, of course, uh, art as such, but they are examples of what was around in the 50s. Um, the one on the right is more of a, um, an eco-warrior style movie, warning us of the folly of our uh, behaviour. Um, but more typical of the period is the one on the left, the invasion of the body snatchers. Uh, these... Um, Movies came out in the era of the McCarthyites uh, persecutions in America where the reds under the bed thing, uh, that the communists were infiltrating all levels of society behind our backs. And of course, uh, um, for aliens in these movies, you could read communists effectively. Mm. But the thing is, of course, movies like this need posters to advertise them. And again, we come across um, art and illustration. And here's a few examples. Mm -hmm. uh, Mon from uh, the late 1920s, uh, Fritz Langfield. Um, interesting, by the way, because I read somewhere that uh, Frau Mond is um, depicts the launch of the rocket with a countdown um, with 10, oh. 9, 8, 7, and the launch. And it was uh, the first ever time that had been done, long before anyone did it in real life. Mm. Um, moving on, of course, 2001 Space Odyssey, everyone knows this film, um, which I remember seeing in the 19, uh, late 1960s, a really uh, remarkable piece of work. You might be interested to know, by the way, that the, um, the spacecraft illustrating it were, were modelled from timber. They were actually carved out of wood, believe it or not, and painted up, um, or at least some of them were. And in fact, actually, I did work briefly in the special effects industry, making spacey things um, before, of course, the computers took over. Um, it was a job I had for a relatively short period. I worked on uh, stuff for the uh, Moonraker film, the James Bond film. And also w when I left, they, we were just on the pre in the process of producing a new R2-D2 um, for the second Star Wars film because the R2-D2 robot in the first film was made from surplus parts from an Air Caravelle airliner and was apparently pretty heavy and hard to move around in. And Kenny Baker, the chap that was inside it, was struggling a bit. So a lightweight copy was needed. Uh, and then we have the, um, the 2001 A Space Odyssey painting there. Um, yes. I have a, a T-shirt with exactly that design on it. All oh, right. OK. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, of course, um, Alien. Um, a Japanese yeah. version of the poster. Um, I like Alien for one reason, I mean, um, and that is that the spacecraft do actually obey Newtonian physics. Unlike <laughs> of them. They certainly yeah. don't in Star Wars, as everyone knows, but they did in Alien. Um, and um, the, the only problem is Alien, in a way, um, to me, illustrates one of the problems with the science fiction movie industry is it is heavily conflated with horror. Um, whereas if you read science fiction books, they're not that many horror books, um, but they usually are when they're on film. And then, of course, we have June, which came out relatively recently. I'm waiting for the second part of that to emerge. March the 1st. Yeah, I gather it's delayed, isn't it? Mm, yeah, well, it, it was delayed. It was due out the end of last year, but they've delayed it to March the 1st. Oh, good. Well, I know it's coming. Fantastic. And then, of course, a couple of movies which, um, again, here's the uh, illustrations that went with them. And uh, these are both pretty intelligent films. Mm. Uh, mm. Made, um, a rival in which, um, as you know, translators are trying to figure out what aliens are trying to say to them. And then on the right, uh, Contact. Well, not surprising it was intelligent because Carl Sagan essentially wrote the book on which the script is based. Uh, it does contain an interesting twist about it because uh, Jodie Foster, 
the scientist is skeptical of the religious views of her boyfriend um, who stood behind her in the picture there um, and says that science requires proof but when she takes her journey into space courtesy of some aliens there's no evidence when she gets back mm -hmm. and forced onto the back foot in front of a congressional committee saying well I really did go there honestly and they say well we got no evidence for it uh -huh. there, there is a there is a shred of truth in the movie and that is that that there's a uh, period of time roughly equivalent to the time that she would have spent missing on the tape That's yes the, 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 nearly at the end isn't it what yeah. yes yes well the politicians I forget it was the Secretary of State I can't remember she said there's nothing on the, uh, the on 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 the tape, but there's 48 hours of nothing on the tape. If I remember yeah. right, or well, something like that. Anyway, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and it was a damn good book too. Really enjoyed that book. Mm, yeah. Um, moving on, of course, uh, we have to talk about this man. Um, yeah. By the way, I don't know how to pronounce his name, whether it's Bonastel or Bostel, but does anyone know? I think it's Bonastel there, uh, Keith. Thank you. Yeah, well, he's one of the most copious and the most um, recognisable of uh, 20th century illustrators of uh, things in space and did a lot of his work before the first spacecraft ever went into to space. Um, we see here on the left uh, the surface of Mercury, which he painted in 1948. You can see some tiny astronauts often dwarfed by the landscape in most of his pictures. You can see the bottom left of the Mercury picture. Mm. Hey, if you're wondering why the sun looks a bit comet-like, it's because uh, they've illustrated the, um, uh, the dust that um, um, uh, exists in the plane of the solar system, the zodiacal light, as it's called, uh, in this picture. And on the right here, we have a picture of Mars, viewed from Phobos. Again, there are some astronauts in the picture. Mm -hmm really fantastic when you consider when they were actually produced and um, um, oh so I'm sorry there's something on top of something else here so I'm going to skip on but um, Bonastel did paint pictures of the surface of Mars um, sometimes with canals sometimes uh, as an arid desert which of course it turned out to be but I thought I'd show you this illustration by a chap called Morel this is from a 1930s encyclopedia and um, you can see here how carried away people were with the Martian Canal thing yeah, uh, sure. in this picture here. But there is something true about this picture. Um, you see a polar sea. Um, and in fact, we now know that at some time in the past, Mars indeed did have a polar ocean. There's a low, fairly relatively flat expanse uh, near the North Pole of Mars uh, with marginal features around it suggest that there was water there at some time but uh, canals no uh, they were a figment of people's imagination um, here's uh, Bonastel's pictures of um, Saturn uh, from Titan and from uh, Mimas um, you can see here I mean if you look at the right hand one first this remarkable image showing the shadow of the rings cast onto Saturn's surface, something that you don't see from Earth, but you could infer if you thought about it three-dimensionally. And you can see a spot on the surface of uh, Saturn there, which is the shadow of one of the other moons of Saturn uh, cast onto the cloud decks of the planet there. And again, tiny astronauts you see in the foreground. And on the left there, this picture of uh, Saturn from Titan, well, the sky isn't right, of course, because we now know that Titan's shrouded in an orange smog. But nonetheless, it is a, 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 a remarkable illustration because, amongst other things, if you look at the left-hand side of Saturn, you can see how the sunlight reflecting off the rings is uh, cast onto the uh, cloud decks of the planet on its dark side. He's thought of all of these things. I think that's amazing, really. It is. It is. Oh, yeah. And here we have um, pictures of Bonastels of, of uh, the moon. Uh, they look very much like the real thing. They really do. If you've seen pictures taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, you'll know that uh, um, that uh, you know, looks pretty similar. By the way, my, my lights in my room just flashed a bit, so don't be surprised by this here in a minute due to the pack up. And here, I've put alongside it Mary McIntyre's uh, 
picture of the uh, middle of the crater Tycho, and uh, um, it's uh, she's copied that. Well, copy is not the right word, but she's used um, one of the LRO images to to produce her work, and you can see how similar um, this illustration produced in the Space Age looks to um, Bonestell's picture, which he painted well before uh, the Space Age started. Um, it shows how good he was. It shows how good Mary is as well. It does, doesn't it? Yes, yes, indeed. Absolutely. Uh, he depicted spaceships in his pictures. Uh, in 48, we have a, the sort of streamlined V2-shaped um, spacecraft, uh, which wouldn't be needed to go to the moon as such, unless you went through the atmosphere first of the Earth. And on the right, uh, probably a more realistic depiction of a lunar landing um, spacecraft, which in space do not need to be streamlined in any way and can be designed in fairly skeletal fashion, as you see in this uh, picture on the right. And um, he also produced sort of informatics, um, um, you know, uh, illustrations to educate. Um, and uh, you see on the left there some subsurface uh, habitation modules. <coughs> moon um there are these um lava tubes on the moon um which you can burrow down inside and the advantage of putting your modules down there is of course you're shielded from the sun's radiation and cosmic radiation in general which is a good idea if you don't want to develop cancer um on the right here we have um, um uh, biodomes with uh, plants growing in them you can see uh, and uh, in the distance there a telescope um, which of course on the moon would work beautifully without an atmosphere to spoil things um, it does however look a bit like a telescope that you would look through the back of which would, wouldn't be a, a very practical thing to do on the moon uh, you would wire it up with a camera uh, that would be the sensible thing um, thinking of those biodomes of course um, uh, well, no, I'll, I'll leave that. Um, but um, Bonnestell also did illustrations of other things. You can see their buildings, bridges. You know, he was pretty um, prolific um, um, illustrator and artist and uh, produced a few film posters, as you can see on the top right there. And uh, there's another one of his lunar illustrations at the bottom. Um, fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And he even ventured out into interstellar space um, and uh, depicted planetary views from exoplanets orbiting other stars. On the right hand side there, you have a planet that is orbiting a rapidly rotating star, which has, as a result of it, turned into an oblate spheroid. Um, in fact, the star out there in Aquila is probably this shape, we think. In fact, actually, um, uh, using inter optical interferometers, we now know it really is that shape, shaped like an M&M. &M. Right. <laughs> the, uh, the other pictures show, um, you know, a binary stars um, and, um, of course, uh, the effect they would have. Um, and, uh, you know, the uh, you get double shadows, you see. If you look on the left-hand picture there, you can see twin shadows produced by the two stars. By the way, he's marked in an orbit for one of them, which, of course, uh, uh, you wouldn't see. But um, you get the idea. And, of course, imitation is a, a serious form of flattery. And, of course, binary star planets, uh, well, there we go. Um, there's one in Star Wars, Tatooine, or Tunisia in real life. <laughs> we, we've only known uh, somewhat recently that uh, planets can maintain stable orbits around a uh, binary star system so that's, that's true yeah that is true yeah 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 we have uh, found a few now haven't we um, a few of the kepler objects uh, i believe are such things um perhaps that wasn't an orbit he was depicting inaccurately perhaps it was meant to be a ring around the planet well here's the thing right there's something interesting about that it could be a ring around a planet, but it's a very oblate spheroid planet, as you can see, suggesting it's either a planet spinning extremely quickly or it's a, a stellar object. By yeah. the way, this picture is not distorted. They really are flattened in the original picture. Um, I don't know is the answer, really. But one thing did occur to me. If it's meant to illustrate an orbit, and I don't know now, because it, you can actually see a line running in front of that object, can't you? Yeah. Um, 
the white object's got a line in front of it. Mm. So it may be right, maybe it meant to be a ring, I don't know. So it's hard to say, isn't it? But yeah, uh, it is. yeah, yeah. Anyway, but if it was an orbital pattern, then that star would actually plunge through the atmosphere of the other star. Yeah. And we do know of examples of that in real life. Um, there are examples, there's one um, binary pair where one star is permanently plowing around inside the upper atmosphere of the other one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's quite an extraordinary thing, really. Mm. Anyway, well, I'll skip on. And, um, um, well, here's an artist who really did go into space, Alan Bean, who was on the Apollo 12 mission, um, um, produced, produced uh, images, uh, well, paintings, I should say, of astronauts on the moon. And one of his distinctive trademarks was the textured surfaces of his paintings um, had boot prints on them, as you can see from the lunar astronauts' boots, mm. um, and um, they're really quite quite uh, remarkable um, in appearance. Really, unfortunately, Alan died um, about uh, six years ago, um, and indeed we're running out of Apollo astronauts now, but not many of them are left. Um, yeah. But uh, the uh, which just goes to show how tardy we have been in going back to the moon, doesn't it? Really, um, but the. Uh, um, these pictures uh, illustrate the sort of thing um, that he did. And in fact, there's some more of his pictures here. Um, here you see uh, one astronaut uh, holding, uh, pulling another one up. Um, falling over was something that happened quite a lot on the moon, <laughs> as yeah. if you ever watch the footage. But with one sixth gravity, uh, it was not likely to cause serious harm. And um, the. Uh, these uh, pictures here on the right, we have the um, Apollo 13 um, problem with the service module illustrated here. Um, and uh, of course, as you know, the uh, uh, one of the fuel cell tanks exploded. And, um, and you can see the fragments are um, surrounding the spaceship. And what most people don't think of when they're on Earth is they think of fragments flying off something and then falling behind, but with no drag in space. The fragments just sail along with you. So mm. it's a permanent cloud of debris that goes with you everywhere you go, um, which to some extent he has illustrated in this picture. Yeah. Um, on the left there, he's sort of, it's a bit of a self portrait for him because he's one of the astronauts in the picture there. Um, uh, Apollo 12 landed very close to uh, an unmanned space probe called Surveyor 3, and um, they went to, the two astronauts went to have a look at it. And um, I think they cut the camera off, if I remember right, and brought it back. Um, I have some recollection of that. Yeah, I seem to remember that as well. Yeah. yeah. And I have recollection as well that they found a rhino virus. <laughs> um, um, yeah, on one of the cameras that had been sneezed on by somebody before it was launched into space. Um, anyway, there we are. By the way, um, somebody re uh, commented this week about the accuracy of lunar landings these days, but these guys managed to put their lunar module down within walking distance of another space pro uh, ship back in 1969. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's not such a new thing, is it, really? Mm. Without the computing power we got today. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the uh, they had three computers on board the Apollo missions, one in the command module and two in the yeah. uh, lunar landing module, and they only had 32K of memory. Exactly. Yeah. And um, the, the memory was um, ferrous core memory, ferrite core memory. Anyway, um, I'm finally, I'm going to finish off by uh, talking a little bit about uh, digital art, and I'm just going to stick to one thing, Terragen. Um the reason I mentioned Terragen is that actually you can download a, um, a sort of atrophied version of it, if you like, to play around with yourself. So if anybody's noted the name, uh, go and look it up and you can download a version of the program and try making some of the um, landscapes that uh, it's possible to make with Terragen. Now, I, used, I use Terragen. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's great fun to play around with. Yeah, I used to use, um, did you ever use Vista Pro? No, I haven't, no. Is no that it good? was sort of the, um, the low-res uh, precursor to, to Terragen, different company. And I oh, spent right. hours creating landscapes, but the, you can then animate and fly through them, and, and it was enormous fun. 
Well, what you're seeing in these pictures that are following um, are in fact um, pictures that are made using Terrigen to produce the um, the the, the, the uh, landscapes, if you like, and then obviously a bit of illustration work um, uh, added to them to produce um, the sort of space, sky and space parts. Well, although when I said not the sky, actually the sky can produce with Terrigen too. Um, but you get the idea in this picture here, and um, uh, we've got a sort of Saturn-like planet with um, um, an Earth-type moon orbiting around it. And in this picture here, we can see um, a planet which is very volcanically active, and uh, obviously lightning strikes due to the dust uh, cr uh, created in the uh, volcanic eruptions. And um, in this picture here, I feel this actually illustrates what Terragen does uh, most, actually. It's quite possible to produce almost everything in that picture just using Terragen alone. It does amazing skies and amazing landscapes as well. It is actually used in the motion picture industry to generate uh, landscapes. Hey, that, yes, and, um, and of course it is used, for, as you rightly say, um, for uh, backgrounds in, uh, yeah, in movies. Um, the full-throated version can. Obviously, the simplified version I played around with doesn't do stuff quite as good as this, but no. you, can, you, can, uh, you can do a remarkable number of things. You can change the angle of the sun, change the type of clouds, change whether the water is choppy or still. Um, you can do all these things by pressing buttons and mucking around with it. It's really quite uh, fun. So this uh, sort of fanciful dirigible flying over this fanciful landscape is all inside a computer, basically. Mm. Uh, here's another one. And by the way, this illustrates where uh, space artists can get a bit carried away. There is absolutely no way that a planet would be as tranquil as the one in the foreground if it was that close to that gigantic planet <laughs> in the background. The tidal forces would be ripping everything to pieces and it would be a hell of hell. Uh, it would be like on. Io. <laughs> like Io, exactly. Um, so there you go. But anyway, it's kind of fun. Um, and we're nearly there. Um, there we go. That's, uh, that's the last one I'm going to show you tonight. The... Uh, Terragen uh, desert landscape and uh, obviously a, um, a uh, spiral galaxy uh, above it. Uh, well, um, as I say, it's incomplete. It's just a few things just thrown about, but I hope you've enjoyed having a look at them. Okay, thanks. Right, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, most interesting. Uh